Thank you. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here today. I'm sorry that I'm not in person, but I hope you all are having fun and learning a ton. Today, I'm gonna to talk about gastrointestinal concerns in HSD and EDS, and I'm gonna make the case that many of these may actually be neuroimmune access disorders. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a neurogastroenterologist. I'm also boarded in autonomic disorders, and I'm the current chair of the GI Consortium for the EDS Society. Next slide. These are my disclosures. Next slide. So I'm gonna to start today by defining the neuroimmune access. And so really what I wanna encourage everybody to do is to think beyond the silos of medical specialties, right? So I know a lot of you have seen different specialists. They don't wanna make the connections between clearly a connective tissue disorder, which is really a complex medical problem that affects all body systems. We need to do better. Next slide. So some of the key concepts that I want you to take away if you take away nothing else from my talk today. The first, the nervous, immune, and endocrine systems play integral roles in maintaining physiological homeostasis. And within tissues, neurons and immune cells are in close physical proximity. This is actually a new concept, um, even though it's actually been known for quite some time, but it's, it's almost like newly discovered. The reason I bring this up is that connective tissues define these interactions. And so we have to be thinking about this when we're thinking about disorders that impact connective tissue. The last is that there is bi-directional communication between neurons and immune cells. And again, connective tissue is defining these interactions. Next slide. So here's the neuroanatomy of the gastrointestinal tract. And so the autonomic nervous system innervates the entire um, gastrointestinal system, including the gastrointestinal tract. The gastrointestinal tract has its own branch of the autonomic nervous system, which is called the enteric nervous system. Next slide. The enteric nervous system controls all sorts of things like motility, secretions, um, immune reactions, barrier function, absorption of nutrients, absorption of water, all of these things are regulated by um, the autonomic nervous system um, directly and also through its subbranch, the enteric nervous system. What I want to demonstrate on this slide is that the enteric nervous system forms this like mesh-like network along the length of the gastrointestinal tract, extending from the top of the esophagus to the anus. This is really important because this mesh-like network, again, is defined by the connective tissue that form all of our organs. And so if you have a connective tissue difference, you're gonna, it's going to impact the structure of the, the enteric nervous system, and that is going to impact its function. Next slide. So in very simplistic terms, the function of the gastrointestinal tract really is to absorb nutrients from our diet and water right? It does a lot of other things um, because it has to, right? Like waste storage and stool formation. It does other things though that we don't really think about. It trains our immune system and this is really important. And the other thing that the gastrointestinal tract does is it actually brings the outside environment into us. And so if you think about the lumen, which is this inner part of the tube of the gastrointestinal tract, that is the outside environment. And what lives within there are actually millions and trillions of microbes all throughout the length of the gastrointestinal tract. So this is the outside environment. So the other thing that the gastrointestinal tract has to do is keep the outside environment outside while being able to bring in nutrients and water that we need to live. Next slide. So this is a cross section of just the tube of the gastrointestinal tract. And so you can see in the center, this is the lumen. So this is the outside world. Um, you have the mucosal layer, submucosal layer, you have an inner circular layer of muscle and an outer longitudinal layer of muscle. And dispersed throughout this is that mesh-like network of the enteric nervous system that we saw earlier, but also networks of vascular um, components like capillaries and other blood vessels, lymphatics, and 70% of our immune system is residing within the gastrointestinal tract. So there's a lot going on here, not to mention all the microbes that live within the lumen of our gastrointestinal tract. Next slide. And so this really represents a critical interface um, of the outside world with the inside world. 
And so we have a number of protective barriers that help us keep that outside world out. But a, but a lot of it is actually regulated by the functions of our autonomic and enteric nervous system and the integrity of our connective tissue. So when we have disorders that impact connective tissue or impact the function of the autonomic nervous system, all of these systems are ripe for perturbation and for things to go wrong. Next slide. So if we start to think about the neuroimmune access in action, we have to think about all of these components, right? I'm gonna give you a few of examples that I hope will help me make my case. Next slide. So this is an example of really important neuroimmune crosstalk. So you can see we have enteric neurons. They're releasing a factor called colony stimulating factor one, doesn't really matter, but it signals to muscularis macrophages. These are important immune cells that live within the tissue. These stimulate these macrophages to produce something called bone morphogenic protein two, which actually signals back to the enteric neurons and regulates motility. So we have a direct evidence that the immune system is modulating motility in us. And so if you have perturbations in either the nervous system or the immune system, you start to have perturbations in function. Next slide. Here's another example. So you have branches of the autonomic nervous system that are directly innervating the tissue of the gastrointestinal tract. And they're signaling to these macrophages again through norepinephrine. The norepinephrine signals to the macrophage to make a small molecules called polyamines. And that doesn't really matter, but what the function of those polyamines is, is really, really important. They actually are important for enteric neuron survival. And this pathway can actually be disrupted during infection, which shuts down the production of norepinephrine and then shuts down the production of these polyamines, which then can lead to enteric neuron death. And so if you think about it, there are a lot of individuals out there who know they had an infection and then they end up with a lot of GI symptoms. We have to be thinking about these pathways because this may actually be a neurodegenerative disorder that has impacted gastrointestinal function. Next slide. Here's another example, our friend, the mast cell. We know that mast cell activation syndrome is incredibly common in people who have connective tissue differences and people with autonomic nervous system disorders. Um, it's, the biology is known, right? Like, but the problem is, is that within the clinical domain, with the exception of a few, including Dr. Maitland, who will speak later, is that this isn't being recognized and treated as it should be because it's contributing to a lot of symptomatology and a lot of pathophysiological changes that are leading to progression of disease. So in this example, you have neurons releasing neurotransmitters and neuropeptides. They're being recognized by mast cells. This is actually triggering mast cells to degranulate and release their um, mediators. And they're listed here are just examples of histamine, serotonin, and tryptase. But we know that there are a lot more mediators that mast cells are releasing that are then interacting with and modulating the behavior of neurons. And so you have this loop of the nervous system activating the immune system and then the immune system feeding back to that, to the nervous system. The other important point that I wanna make with this slide is that this also shows that mast cells are not just activated through IgE related mechanisms. This is an example of a non IgE mediated process that's leading to mast cell degranulation. It's going to lead to a ton of symptoms in whatever tissue is occur this occurs. Next slide. This slide is busy, but really it's just showing you that there are a ton of other examples out there where you have this crosstalk between the nervous system and the immune system. It's regulating inflammation. It's regulating host defenses. This is huge um, and really, really important for disease pathology. Next slide. And so then if we add on top of that, our gut microbiota is also commuting with our nervous system, immune system, and enteroendocrine systems. Next slide. And how does it do it? Well, there's actually a lot of ways that the microbiota have been shown to communicate directly with um, these different systems. For example, you can have microbes secreting small molecules that enter the blood and travel all the way to the central nervous system. 
You also can have microbes that are activating enteroendocrine cells. And these are a special type of enteroendocrine cells called neuropods. These neuropods directly synapse with components of the enteric nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, which in turn are communicating with the central nervous system. So you can see, you can get from all the way from the outside environment in the lumen of our gastrointestinal tract, you can have microbes that are actually regulating neurological function. Microbes can also activate other types of enteroendocrine cells, which release hormones that can have both local and distant effects. Microbes can also influence immune cell function and inflammation, which we've already shown affects the functions of the enteric nervous system, autonomic nervous system, and central nervous system. So there's really a lot going on in the gastrointestinal tract. And so it's not surprising that in complex multi-system disorders, such as disorders involving connective tissue, that there's a lot of symptoms happening in the gastrointestinal tract. And we as physicians need to be more thoughtful about it when we're making recommendations for patients because there's a lot more that we can do. Next slide. So I think that if we frame this as neuroimmune access disorders rather than just GI disorders, right? We're, we're entering into a systems biology way of thinking about complex conditions. And what this helps us do is actually accelerate research in this area and really advance clinical care. And there is a lot that we can do. Next slide. And so I'm gonna to talk to you about how we can actually make an appropriate diagnosis that then can allow us to utilize other therapeutic options. Next slide. So these are the typical diagnostic modalities that are you know, available for most of your physicians, including your gastroenterologist, right? So we can do laboratory-based testing to look at immune, infectious, or genetic contributions. We can do motility testing. We can do endoscopy and look for structural, immune, or infectious etiologies. We can do imaging, and we can do breath testing. But really, for the most part, most of these tests are not actually getting at the pathobiological mechanism that is driving the disorder. Instead, it's telling us something is wrong. And we can combine this with other testing modalities to actually make a much better diagnosis. Next slide. So for example, motility testing. There are lots of ways to do this. My favorite, and I think most powerful within um, patients that have connective tissue disorders, is utilizing a technology called the Smart Pill Wireless Motility Capsule. And what this allows us to do is actually measure um, gastric emptying, small intestinal transit, and colonic transit. And it does this by you swallow a pill and wear a recorder for up to five days. And so the, the pill that you swallow can actually measure temperature. Um, and so that is represented at the blue line at the top of the screen. And that tells us when the capsule enters and exits the body, right? So that's the total time of the study. The green line that you see actually measures pH. And what that does is that helps us understand the location in the gastrointestinal tract where the capsule is. And so at the very scrunched up portion of the screen, there is, um, you can see the green bar is very, very low. This is the stomach because the stomach, it has the lowest pH. You can see when um, the capsule gets passed into the small intestine, the pH dramatically rises because you see that increase in the green line. And then you can see that it increases over time until it abruptly drops again when it enters the colon. And so um, that helps us understand when the capsule passes out of the stomach into the small intestine and then out of the small intestine into the colon. And we can measure time because time is on the x-axis below. The red spikes that you can see at the bottom, that's actually measuring intraluminal pressure. And so every time the bowel squeezes on the capsule, we're able to measure the strength of that contraction. Um, this is a case of a young woman who her doctors were convinced that she was faking not being able to eat because her gastric emptying study was normal. And so we did this test and actually showed that, in fact, her gastric emptying study was normal. Actually, it was a little bit on the fast side, but it definitely wasn't slowed. And they were expecting to found, find profound gastroparesis, and they didn't. And because they didn't, they assumed she was making this up. When we did this study, we found that her small intestinal transit time was three times the upper limits of normal. So instead of being six hours, it was 18 hours long. Her colonic transit time um, was 
almost 150 hours. The normal is 10 to 60 hours. So you could tell that these are wildly prolonged transit times, which means that she actually met criteria for intestinal failure, truly could not eat by now, mouth, and needed IV nutrition. So this tells us there's something severely wrong, but it doesn't tell us why. Next slide. If we can partner in-depth motility testing with techniques such as endoscopic full thickness biopsies, we can actually do a lot better. This is a device we can use during routine endoscopy to take a sample of the entire wall of the gastrointestinal tract. Next slide. And then what we can do is we can do tissue level enteric nervous system mapping to look at that mesh-like network and to see if there's any alterations in it. We can also do in-depth immune profiling at the tissue level through all the different layers. I'm gonna give you an example of why this is super cool. Next slide. So this is from a paper published several years ago uh, where they looked at individuals who had intestinal failure and the top panels where the stains in brown, you can see that they stain for the myenteric plexus, which is part of the enteric nervous system. In the cases, you can see that the staining is much lighter and almost gone. So this shows that this is neurodegeneration. In the bottom panels, they stain for mast cells. Those are the little brown dots. You can see in the cases, uh, including with high, um, higher uh, magnification, that there's a huge amount of mast cell infiltrate into the tissue where we have neuronal loss. They also stain for eosinophils and lymphocytes, and they're as present as well. They're not supposed to be, so this is pathology. This gives us potentially a therapeutic target to treat motility disorders. Next slide. The last thing I'm gonna talk about is a tool that we can use to diagnose non-IgE mediated allergies. Next slide. It's called confocal laser endomicroscopy. It's a super cool technique that we can use during a routine endoscopy um, where we can look at the epithelial layer in real time and look at its integrity. So you can see in panel A, this is individual epithelial cells. You can see the outline of them there. It's like a little black thin line. And then you can see that the tip of them is very bright. This is because the person has been injected with a contrast agent called fluorescein and it accumulates within these cells. The black space in panel A is actually the lumen. So that's the outside world, right? So the outside part of um, the uh, gastrointestinal tract. And then you can notice that there's no fluorescein there. When we add an antigen that the person is allergic to, the cells actually rupture and release fluorescein into the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract, indicating a non-IgE mediated allergy is present to whatever the compound was that they were exposed to. Next slide. This allows us to give truly prescriptive diets, and this is super important. When they tested people that have a diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome, um, which I know many of you do, um, they found that 70% of those individuals had a non-IgE mediated allergy. So this allows us to remove the trial and error of guessing about what, you, what compound you should remove from the diet. We can actually test it directly. We can also detect alterations in mucosal barrier function at baseline. These are things that can't be diagnosed using routine histology. We also can detect eosinophilic activation and very likely mast cell activation because mast cells are also involved in both IgE and non IgE mediated allergies and mast cell disorders are so prevalent uh, in patients with connective tissue differences. The current estimates are that 50% of patients walking around with a diagnosis of IBS actually have a non IgE mediated allergy. So that means we could do elimination diet, a prescriptive elimination diet um, to actually improve symptoms rather than doing non specific um, treatments targeted at symptoms that we don't even understand. This is a huge breakthrough, it's so powerful. Next slide. So in closing, I would just say that we can improve the diagnosis through discovering the mechanism of dysfunction. And a lot of these technologies already exist and need to be leveraged to, to be able to do this. This expands our therapeutic options and allows us to move beyond symptomatic management, which is something that you all deserve. Next slide. This is my closing slide. It's not showing for me, but really in closing, 
I want to thank all of my patients for everything that they share with me because it allows me to learn from them every day and come up with new ideas to improve both di diagnostics and therapeutics. And thank you for your time.